We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today uh, on behalf of DCH Alliance to organize this session. Uh, I know that uh, for several of you participating, this won't be, uh, let's say, an interactive session because you are either in Poland watching this or following in YouTube. Well, even if you cannot send us your questions, we'll try to keep this session as lively as possible and, um, well, uh, make it worthwhile for you to be following it. So before I start introducing the panelists to the session, I would like to, uh, on one side, uh, introduce you to the two colleagues from the European Connected Health Alliance who are organizing the session with me. It is Carolina Makievics, the Innovations Director, and Natalia Allegretti, a Senior Project Manager. They will be both following the session with us and, of course, bringing any updates as necessary. They will also be posting on social media with our other colleagues, so please follow up on that as well. And um, to, to, let's say, make the first uh, connection to the content of the session, well, you have seen the title. Uh, and the truth is that this is something that we have been following very um, attentively uh, throughout the last years. Uh, before the COVID pandemic, there was a lot, a number, there was already a number of issues that were connected with the the need to keep everyone connected with the, the innovations that suddenly come into our life every day based on technological disruption. But the truth is that the COVID pandemic exposed a lot more this critical need of using digital every day, as we are doing today in a hybrid event, for example, and the fact that uh, this may uh, need a, a set of measures that partly are still to be put in place to make sure that everyone can participate. Um, of course, that this goes from a number of broad uh, uh, areas, such as digital inclusion, digital literacy, but also access, economics and, and financial capacity, accessibility. So we have a number of different areas that are very important to make sure that no one is left behind. And today we will be mainly discussing three broad issues, let's say. How can we implement a digital European society that is inclusive and sustainable? And secondly, are we sure that digital products and services that are developed every day are accessible and fit to different target audiences? And what are the key priorities that we need to scope, search and uh, prioritize for the next period? Is it infrastructure, digital health information, online education, literacy and skills, equal opportunities regardless of gender, race, disability, adequate protection of workers' rights, what else? So to answer this very, let's say, difficult question, but at least to attempt to bring some key ideas to the discussion, we have the pleasure to have six wonderful panelists with us today that I will just introduce uh, in, in a, a random order as they are shown also here in the panel. So Katrin Kronaki, many thanks to jo for, for, for joining us today. She's the Secretary General at HL7 Europe and also the President of the European Federation for Medical Informatics. Today she will also be here on behalf of the IMI Gravitate Health Project that she will connect with the overall discussion. Also, Kara Lampos Vasiliu is a digital strategy and business development advisor and, of course, a very experienced project, project manager in the European Union, ICT expert, and also linked to Byte Computer. And in that we have is also representing the H2020 Smart Work project in our discussion today. Claudia Rivera is a researcher and a lecturer at the Technical, Technological University of Dublin, and she will bring us a little flavor of the Interreg project EU Schaffe. George Valiotis, many thanks for joining us. He's the executive director of EMA, the European Health Management Association, and he will also bring us today 
as some parts of their projects, such as the Erasmus Plus dish. Alexander Payne has a very long uh, curriculum, so I'll try to make it shorter. He's an associate professor of aging and technology at Utrecht University. He's also a founding chair of the Sociogeron Technology Network and vice chair of JPI Morir Better Lives. He's here also today on behalf of the Gatekeeper Project, uh, Horizon 2020. And last but surely not least, Mary Kanapusa, Innovation Man Project Manager at the United Nations Global Post Finland, a uh, uh, UN initiative on big data and artificial intelligence for public good. I hope I didn't leave much behind. And if I did, please feel free to share informally. What we intend today is to have a small presentation by each of you in the beginning of the session, but then to keep it open, informal, and have as much discussion as possible. So, considering the, the initial approach to this discussion, uh, I would perhaps ask George if you are um, open to start and, and uh, share with us your thoughts. We discussed a lot on uh, the the EU, uh, EU approach to digital transformation and health is, is an area of interest to us. Are we sure that we are actually including everyone in this digital transformation of health? Can you talk to us a little bit about the European Union, Union approach on this and of course also of Emma's? Sure, thanks very much, Karina, for uh, inviting me to speak today. And I'm really pleased to be presenting digitally in Poland. I was there a few weeks ago, in fact, for our DISH project, which I'll tell you a bit about in a moment. I think these are very important conversations for us to be having. Karina, you framed it well by saying they're big, broad issues. And um, so what I'm going to present to you is just a bite-sized piece of some of the things that we can contribute to. I'm fully aware it's a really small part of the bigger picture of how do we address this complexity. So. Um, let me start with the with the background of what we're observing across the European Union. We've seen that um, that the European Union has highlighted three main objectives for digital transformation of health systems. So the first one that we're seeing is giving citizens better access to their health data. This is going to be a really big issue that needs a, a lot of thought, but it's one of their policy drivers is, is access to health data. The next one will be the use of digital tools to empower citizens and facilitate person-centered care. So you can see this theme of citizenship coming through and making sure that individuals have their rights protected and the information about themselves protected and access to their own information. And finally, we're seeing the need to connect and share health data for research, faster diagnosis and better health outcomes. So this last point is about pushing into the, the next dimension, which is you've got your data, you've got access to your data, you know that your rights are being protected, and now we need your trust to share that information so it can be applied for bigger uses, such as having the mass data to make better understanding of diseases, better understanding of, of well-being outcomes, because we need mass data to do that. But we can only get that mass data through collaboration and trust with all of the citizens of Europe. Now, um, that's what we've observed as the policy context. These are the themes that are coming out in a lot of the uh, EU policies, as well as their calls for tender. Um, what now, if we think about Emma um, and what, what we believe, so these are the themes that have come out of our conferences, our discussions with our members, uh, and some of the outcomes of our project works. Firstly, we're seeing that it's people that drive change. So don't get lost in the digitalization of this. This is always about people. So digital transformation has to be built on trust. It's the single most important thing. And anytime we see this go digital implementation go wrong, it's because trust has gone wrong. So there's your starting point. On to point two, we know that patients should be clearly informed about the use of their data and aware of the benefits of sharing their data for improving care. That clearly touches on some of the points I mentioned in the previous slide. And again, it's that trust. Trust, openness, communication. Point three, the adoption of new processes, tools and models of service delivery should have accessibility and inclusivity as leading factors. So Karina, I know that I'm almost being a bit oversimplistic because you've asked me what can be done to address this and I'm saying, make sure you address it. My answer is make sure you address it. It's not an answer, is it? But actually it is an answer in that uh, I'm going to talk to you more about the role of health managers. And health managers really play this halfway point between policymakers at one end and the person receiving the care, the citizen at the end of the, of the spectrum there. So they're in the middle. Their job is to transfer all that policymaking into practice. They help guide the thinking, they help guide the priorities, 
in practice. So point three is really about the role of health managers. And then finally, point four is that um, it's more than health managers, is that everybody has a role in digital health literacy. So we want to see a, a literate society of digital health. But to, to achieve that, you can't just focus on citizens and keep saying we need, our, we need patients, we need residents to be more health literate. If you want to achieve that, you need organisations to step up. And that might be a hospital, that might be a primary care unit, that could be a public health institution, that could also be um, NGOs, that can be a, the role of government. All of the organisations have a role in supporting the digital literacy, not just of ourselves, but also of ultimately the patient who's benefiting from this care. That includes carers and it includes healthcare professionals. All of us need to be learning together in partnership. So finally, I'm going to give you three, um, three small examples. You did mention at the start that I would reference the DISH project, and I'm going to do that um, because it's a really important project that, that absolutely addresses health literacy. The way that it does it, it's been funded by the Erasmus Plus uh, under the European Commission to look at all of these, there's these great digital innovations. They exist in plentifulness but they're not being implemented fully by health systems. And the reason being is that health systems have, are busy, they've got a lot going on. And in order to develop the skills and the practice and the approach to take on these digital innovations, we need a special way of, of doing that training and doing that implementation. So DISH is helping us through a series of different um, test cases of implementing these technologies. Now that requires health management leadership, it requires practitioners, educators, it requires engagement with patients. So DISH has been really great at piloting these implementations and we're learning about how do you make sure that we make the most of these digital innovations. And, and Karina, you can see the way that this then puts into practice that actual, that trust, that relationship building that we're all involved. The DISH project focuses on the workplace and the, the health professional, but it benefits for the benefit of, of patients. And then finally, I'll just tell you about Rebecca and Hart. There are also two projects funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 program. And they're quite interesting because they're using wearable technologies. Both of them use it a bit differently. So Rebecca uses it for breast cancer survivors. So they, they're using wearables, they're min, minimally obtrusive. People can, we can use that to collect real world data from the patients wearing it, and they can also input data. And we're wanting to learn about their overall well being, their medical uh, status, as well as their, their emotional and mental well being. And then we're using that to better understand how patients are, um, are living in their in post breast cancer recovery so that we can help make better decisions and give them better quality of life. Heart is, is also using wearables to look at green and blue areas. So green being forests and parks and blue being water sources like uh, swimming pools or lakes and rivers. And it's trying to triangulate two things. So one is how do people access these areas? And so tracking them using these devices. And secondly, what does that impact could that potentially be having on general health and well-being, like cardiovascular health, type 2 diabetes? And the reason that one's quite important is it, it recognizes that the health system is overburdened, it can't meet its full demands. And so we need to make it more accessible and understand health in its broader sense. And if we can design, if we can do better urban design that allows um, us to learn better how to keep people healthy, it means the hospital or the primary care unit doesn't become the bottleneck of us having health and well-being. It makes health more broadly accessible. So those are the, 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 the projects in, in short summary, and uh, I'd be happy to talk about that more as we will go through this session. Thank you so much, George. It was very clear and very illuminating as well. I do have already a number of questions in my mind for the discussion part, but if you all agree, we would then have this first row of each panelist putting forward some ideas and we can then discuss them all together. So uh, based, well, departing also from what George brought us, I, I would ask you, Caris, Caralampos, if you can uh, uh, bring us a little bit of your knowledge on how national governments are tackling these challenges, including those brought by the pandemic. George talked about the need for having multiple types of organizations, stakeholders, et cetera, uh, addressing these challenges. So I know you have some interesting experiences to share with us, either from projects, but mainly also from the Greek government. Uh, can I ask you then to come forward? 
thank, thank you. you very much for for this uh, warm invitation and, and great introduction in the beginning uh, and it's a very big pleasure for me to be here among these uh, panelists of uh, great co-workers so yeah uh, really interesting topic today and um, uh, apart from my capacity as a project coordinator for smart work as you you very elegantly said in the beginning it's uh, it's also in my capacity as a digital transformation advisor here at the ministry of digital governance that i can bring some insight also with respect to the angle of digital skills um, which is also quite a critical element and how uh, you know inclusive and accessible these um, these elements of, of policy design per country level uh, is uh, focus on. So um, let's start with um, with designing uh, a digital strategy for um, emphasizing on digital skills on behalf of um, on the governmental level. And um, this is quite an interesting topic because uh, back in uh, 2019, when this uh, latest government was elected, they they started really enhancing the digital strategy uh, here in Greece um, well before the pandemic. Um, and uh, one of the major initial goals that um, uh, we have set was to, to build uh, the updated Greek digital transformation strategy, uh, what's so-called the digital transformation Bible here in Greece uh, for, for the years 2020 until 2025. And um, not surprising enough, we can see that this was based on, on seven critical goals and six strategic pillars. And uh, as you can see, digital skills was and still is one of the key elements uh, in, 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 as we have seen, uh, making any digital strategy transformation successful. Um, so the, the design was focused on the, um, the strategic pillars of connectivity. So uh, focus on infrastructures, on digital skills, as I mentioned before, and we will focus a little bit more on that later, later on on digital innovation, testing new technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so forth to be embedded into public service delivery, uh, creating a much better, uh, mature, um, and, and, and digitally literate state, uh, providing uh, a wide range of public services, um, and then focus on two other elements which were kind of important. Digitally transform the business sector as well as general other elements of the economy such as health, as, as George uh, very nicely mentioned a few key topics earlier on. Um, you know the justice system, uh, education, and, and so forth. And um, if we if we look a little bit more also on the goals, we can see that um, the overall approach is is emphasizing on on uh, on the citizen as well uh, to serve the needs that the citizen have um, through a digital state to promote the development of digital skills, um, to to support innovation, and to to make businesses. Uh, more digitized, uh, have uh, open data, publicly available data, uh, integrate uh, all these modern technologies into, into the sectors of the economy and so forth. And, 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 and digital skills is a critical factor because we've seen, for instance, as an example, that um, we developed this strategy well on time before the pandemic and we started developing a lot of digital skills. I mean, we started becoming a digital state just before the pandemic. And um, we were providing uh, digital services to the general public and, and to citizens, but many of them were not able to use these uh, services uh, because they were not as advanced in terms of um, digital literacy. So it, it was really um, a, a baffling element, the fact that we needed to also um, invest on digital skilling and reskilling, upskilling and so forth in order for them to be able to utilize to a better extent uh, the services provided. So uh, the strategy had one important element, which was to improve the digital abilities and, and the digital skills for, for everybody. And uh, towards that end, we, we started working also on a national digital academy uh, in order to, um, you know, bring um, educational aspects, digital literacy, much closer to all age groups uh, and, and, and enable them to acquire new skills. Um, and this is also one of the slides I'm, I'm going to bring up later on. So the whole digital transformation strategy was guided by uh, the user-centered approach. Um, and it had some very basic principles such as um, de developing services which are digital by default, creating omni-channel services, and um, one key element that uh, links everything together is the fact that 
services and the principles behind the strategy uh, had the element and the notion of inclusiveness and accessibility, apart from other elements such as transparency, integrity, um, you know, um, giving the, the citizens the ability to provide just only once uh, most of the information that they had. So as you can see, all the elements of digital skills, inclusiveness, accessibility, all started to line up together leading us to the uh, National Digital Academy, as I mentioned before. So this was a pilot project that started in the early days of the strategy and now is evolving into uh, a much more uh, wider uh, version of this uh, platform. So it's the Citizens Digital Academy, um, which is developed by the Ministry of Digital Government that basically provides uh, online educational material free for all citizens and, and accessible for all citizens just to uh, improve their digital competences. And now we're moving into the second stage, which is becoming much wider. The ministry is starting to develop its own courses and we're looking also at the competences framework, which is standardized in order to, um, you know, to, to fulfill and close up the circle behind all these uh, services. Now, how are these all related to, to smart work, which is my experience and in and, and, and my capacity as the, the project coordinator on this very interesting project, which uh, was focusing primarily on a specific target group of, of AIDS workers between 55 and 65 in order to try and assist them and provide a set of services to, to keep them active in the professional life and their independent living, as well as creating um, a, a well-being uh, notion behind it, making it um, much more healthier, uh, healthier conditions and uh, much more productive. And towards that end, uh, we developed this AI um, system that was worker-centric, also including other stakeholders, key stakeholders into the whole uh, healthcare uh, pathway, such as uh, the uh, carers, uh, and uh, also since we're talking about workers, uh, bringing on the um, uh, the, um, uh, the 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 co-workers, the um, the managers of, of these people into context, and therefore we develop a set of services. I'm not going to go into all of them, but let's focus also on one of the key services that we had, which was the work code service, which focuses exactly on the topic we're talking about today, how to improve skills for uh, AIDS workers, how to promote re-skilling and upskilling based on the um, evolving needs, both of the company, of the technological competences that we want to promote, and then the needs behind the, uh, the, the teams that are created in the work environment. So, this is a very interesting uh, service focusing on, on personalized aspects of, of uh, reskilling and upskilling. And this has a foreseen impact in, in many levels, as you can see. So we're not talking about the we're not talking only about the older office worker or the, the employers and the carers. We also have um, uh, an, an important impact on, on other elements, such as the healthcare system by reducing expenses, uh, on the scientific community by bringing new innovative ICT tools based on on uh, AI technologies and, and, and other uh, forefront technologies that are also seen now on uh, Horizon, um, on Horizon Europe and, and Digital Europe programs for the Commission. And finally, some uh, very important impact on, on the society level, such as you know, enhancing innovation capacity, increasing the economic independence and so forth. So, I mean, towards this end, all these combined bring the need behind uh, making uh, digital uh, skilling, uh, reskilling and upskilling more inclusive, more accessible. And um, there are very important elements, both at governmental level and at research level that promote this uh, aspect. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Karis, for this first introduction. I think you, you brought up very interesting areas that we will for sure also uh, discuss afterwards, namely the role of governments and also this uh, a very interesting perspective on how some specific or, or niche projects such as this one focused on workers can go uh, can go uh, and impact so many areas of society. That is very interesting. So uh, we have been discussing mostly EU projects and EU initiatives, but uh, we have a whole world <laughs> beyond the EU. And I know Mary here who is uh, with us today will bring us a bit broader um, beyond Europe uh, because a lot of the challenges we are discussing today are worldwide and, and namely misinformation, disinformation, and a lot of this affects especially people that are, that are in, in more vulnerable contexts or more marginalized. So I know you are developing a very interesting WHO project that reads social media and radio messages to Africa. Can you share with us these examples and, and enlarge the discussion? Thank you so much, Mary. 
Um, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are. Okay, excellent. Um, so um, thank you so much, uh, Karina, for inviting us. Um, and uh, um, apologies, are you seeing my uh, presentation? Yes, we are. It okay, first, excellent. The first slide, you mean? Yeah, yes? yeah, yes, yeah. excellent. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm sharing. <laughs> um, thank you, Karina, for inviting my views on the important topic of uh, shaping digital market accessible for all citizens. Uh, the previous panelists, George and Caris, before me, has focused on relevant issues of digital inclusion uh, in the whole of Europe, as well as digital transformation in the context of Greece. Uh, I will focus on a global perspective. Um, uh, I work at uh, the UN uh, Global Pulse um, uh, Finland lab. Uh, UN Global Pulse is UN Secretary General's Innovation Lab, which was originally established in 2009. Um, it mainly focused on uh, utilizing the power of big data and artificial intelligence um, in the context of humanitarian and development um, areas uh, that various UN agencies work. It's a global network of labs uh, with offices in uh, New York, Kampala, Jakarta, and um, I'm based in Helsinki. Uh, we have uh, developed uh, different kinds of projects. The project that I'm dealing with um, is related to infodemic. Um, infodemic, uh, as you all know, um, is has has been widely uh, happening in the era of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, leading in February 2020, WHO Chief Dr. Tedros to announce that uh, we are not really dealing with a pandemic, uh, we are dealing with uh, infodemic. Uh, infodemic mainly involves overabundance of information in digital as well as non-digital spaces, physical spaces where people are present, uh, often accompanying some kind of a, a acute health event similar to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic we are in. It often involves um, fake news, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, the problem is that it's not only somebody uh, spreading uh, some uh, lies across different platforms, it directly affects medical decisions. Uh, it, it has a direct impact on physical and mental health of individuals. In addition, it also erodes trust in uh, respected uh, institutions offering healthcare service to people. Often marginalized communities are the ones that are um, disproportionately affected by uh, an infodemic. We are living in an era of digital transformation. Uh, there is, if, if you look at in Europe, we have like 90 percentage of um, coverage of uh, internet in our houses um, across Europe uh, by the uh, statistics from 2020. However, when you look at a global scale, 38 percentage of people in the world do not have access to internet. And there are around 7,000 living languages around the world. However, if you look at the digital content that is available in internet, 10 languages represent 80 percentage of total digital content available online. And out of this, English and Chinese form almost half of the whole content that's available in internet. If this is the case, uh, how do we make sure that the voices of the languages that are not represented in the digital world or the people who are, don't even have access to the digital world or internet, how do they have access and how do we ensure that we have no voice left behind? At UN Global Pulse, uh, since 2013, my colleagues um, at Pulse Lab Kampala uh, has been working, um, looking at radio data uh, and working with various UN agencies to predict drought, uh, problems in agriculture, uh, water supply, and different issues. Uh, I am managing a project for WHO where we are looking at integrating um, online radio uh, information um, to help WHO fight its infodemic, um, uh, infodemic efforts. Uh, in many of the African countries, uh, people uh, get their news from radio uh, and they talk in radio chat shows about their concerns and questions. 
so this uh, project allows uh, to develop a platform where uh, WHO officials could see what are the main concerns that people are raising so that they could uh, plan their uh, campaigns to address these concerns. Uh, in addition, infodemic is not the only matter that is affected by uh, this uh, underrepresented group in internet. How do we reach out to these communities? Uh, there must be ways uh, in which we can listen to non-mainstream languages uh, and uh, people's concern uh, who speak these mainstream, non-mainstream languages. Uh, there needs to be uh, ways to reach out to people in channels other than social media. Uh, the discussions um, in social media are, um, are guided by people who have access to internet and uh, this uh, privilege of um, having internet. In addition, a very important thing, um, um, my, the fellow panelist George already mentioned digital literacy. There is also the need for uh, media literacy where uh, people are taught uh, to critically assess the information that they see and see um, facts from lies and uh, um, make their own decision, uh, thinking in a logical manner. Uh, in addition, uh, it's also important that um, when um, countries are planning uh, any campaigns to inform people, this information and the digital tools that are made available to citizens are also available in non-mainstream languages. Um, Karina, I, I have some other points to elaborate, but we could take that in the discussion. Over to you. Thank you. Karina, can you hear me? Okay, I hope we didn't uh, lose Karina. I will, Karina, we cannot hear you. All right, that's a small uh, technical uh, issue. Uh, you're on mute, Karina. Can you? Yeah. Yes. Can Can you? Sorry. Yes, we can hear I, you now. I yes. had some. I'm I'm having a storm here, and I had some disruption in my connection. Oh, <laughs> wow. okay. It was a bit sudden, but I think I think I'm back now. Yes, it was you're a back quick now. Recovery. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see if it holds. I hope so. But uh, Carolina, in any chance you are already <laughs> exactly? Yes, <laughs> I will. Sorry. I will. See. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. I um. I'm sorry, Marie. Did you did you end it? Did you uh, end it? Yes, <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, yes. I ended. Thank it. you so but, much. Uh, we can continue uh, more questions in the discussions, Karina. Yes, I think that I I I accompanied most of what you said. So and and I I already know your presentation from before. So thank you so much. I think it was very interesting. This was the last part I I heard. Uh, the the question of uh, literacy not being only in terms of digital but also of media and the the the, the contents that are uh, broadcasted. So you don't. It is not enough to be able to access the tools, but the question of understanding what is actually correct information or some so many times fake news makes also a very big difference. And even if I acknowledge that in some countries, the tools used may be very different from others, uh, for sure, the concerns are probably very similar. <laughs> So thank you so much, Marie. I, I think you can uh, stop sharing your screen if possible, because oh. I would pass I would pass the floor back yeah. uh, to another panelist. In this case, yeah. Catherine. Um, oh. Catherine, well, you also have a, a, a stronger focus in Europe, but I know your work also goes beyond. And uh, in this framework we have been discussing, perhaps on, on different levels, I would very much like to ask you now if you could talk us a little bit of how standards can help us uh, in this yeah. uh, challenge of being able to, of being sure that no one is left behind. Thank you. Sure, I, I thank you very, very much of the, uh, for this invitation. And, and I'm really glad to be part of this panel with uh, the distinguished uh, speakers that cover the most important part. 
And for any endeavor, the most important part is people. Because uh, it's, it's, uh, it, the technology is here to change the life of people. And, and for me, interoperability is the same way. So uh, here in my first slide, I give you the vision of, for the global health ecosystem, which is people which have navigation tools for safe and informed care and interoperability assets that fuel creativity, entrepreneurship, and innovation. And what this means is that we need the new technology standards. We need technology standards that can help people. It can help by nurturing digital health innovation, by strengthening the Europe's voice, because we are talking about Europe here, and impact, of course, and then enable co-creation, enable participation and contribution of the needs. Because this is what essentially makes services that are meaningful. We heard from the previous speakers a number of initiatives that would help people in uh, working everywhere, from everywhere, or on, on adjusting to the new digital uh, environment. But for that, you need interoperability. And interoperability is for technology. It's also very much for people, for people to uh, say what they have to say and understand and translate that into meaningful uh, digital services. Yeah. So this is my first point. The second point is that in e standards, standards that are serving as infrastructure for innovation, you need to um, essentially fulfill four elements. The first one is trust and flow, and that refers to data. Create the circumstances that will allow you to share data safely and in a trustworthy manner, because trust and flow is the basis for well-functioning health systems. And we do recognize four perspectives. There are three other perspectives, of course, the perspective of the citizens, which the previous speakers have explained, but also and the perspective of the workforce, we, we heard this well, but there is also the market. The market is about innovation and how you translate innovation into uh, mainstream services. Uh, so these are reflected in the standard compass, which essentially says that we should the different perspectives that I just mentioned, the health system, the citizen, the workforce, and the market. And then you need to be having a core set of functionality, like components, which are technical components that are understood, well understood, that fit together so that you can be able to reuse them. But in order for that to happen, people need to collaborate. And they can collaborate when you set up structures for co-creation, governance, and alignment. So, uh, we have done that. We have done that in the context of the electronic health record exchange format. Uh, and um, there we are looking into lab observations and results, diagnostic images, discharge reports, patient summaries, imprescription in dispensation. But then you need to put them in the right context, in the right services that are meaningful and people are having the digital skills that allow them to use them. So we need services that use this interoperable component. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So some examples that we are working on and our core element of this idea of reusable components is the patient summary. And you see here the components, medication summary, allergies, problem list as the main necessary ones, but also immunization, think COVID, history of procedures, medical devices, diagnostic results. We have worked on, we are actually working on a project called this uh, uh, Pancare Surpass, which is about the survivorship passport. These are for children that have survived the cancer and they need a passport to be able to convey the information that will allow them to pursue healthy living and meaningful occupation. So it fits very nicely with the speech of the previous speakers um, regarding occupational uh, services and uh, regarding uh, digital health literacy. The other thing that uh, Karina
that uh, we see in every medication. Yeah. So we are kind of, you know, we unfold this huge thing like, like Maria, our ambassador here, and we don't know what's relevant for us. The question we are solving here in this uh, IMI project is whether with uh, the patient summary, with the knowledge of our file, our health goals, our medication, our allergies, uh, our vaccinations, perhaps we can tell what is relevant in this largely legal document. What does it mean for us? And think if, if you are like an older person, you have about 20 of these, I mean, you cannot read them. The letters, the accessibility, and we mentioned accessibility earlier, is next to zero. Can we do something about technology? Can we give the digital skills for people to use them? Can we help them take charge of their lives? Huh? This, is, this is the problem we are currently uh, addressing here in this IMI project, and I'm so happy to be part of it. So are we getting there? That's, we are working on it. We are working on it and taking now my hat as FME president of the European Federation of Medical Informatics. We are not there yet, but we are working. We are working. We don't know what the future holds, but we are keep working. Yeah, we keep working. And one initiative that I would like to point out is the One Digital Health. <clears throat> where we are trying to collect the data, not only from healthcare, but also from animal health, from the environment, and bring them all together to realize one health. And I'll stop here. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Catherine, uh, for this very engaging presentation. It's impossible not to be catch up by your passion presenting this and, and um, taking a little bit of uh, this uh, final uh, issue that you mentioned, which is connected to One Health. Perhaps this is something that you can also uh, debate a bit further during the discussion, because I think it would be very interesting for, for the, the audience. Uh, well, Catherine was presenting a project that has uh, a lot of impact on other adults, and this would lead us to the next speaker, uh, Alexander Payne, uh, because, uh, well, uh, you are an expert in this area, and uh, we know for a fact that there are specific groups, well, even if they are, of course, not um, if they are uh, built by different people, but there are specific challenges uh, to address perhaps with older adults and also uh, different ways of, of identifying how to tackle and overcome them. So could I pass you the floor, uh, Catherine, if I can ask you also to stop sharing? Um, and Alexander, could I pass you the floor to follow on and, and give us your thoughts? Thank you. Yes, sure. Uh, thanks, Karina. I hope you can, can hear me. Let me share my screen. Uh, here it is. So essentially, you should be seeing uh, an empty slide right now. Um, because I did, um, well, I prepared a little bit of a provocation or a conundrum for today that I'd like to present rather than give you a sort of a full fledged overview of projects I work on. Um, maybe I can say a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a sociologist. I'm a, an associate professor at the University of Utrecht. So in my daily life, I study encounters between, let's say, aging and technology. So I study encounters between older people and their devices in their lives. But I also study encounters of engineers or designers when they are designing for older people and how they well, meet older people, but sometimes only meet aging. So how they imagine ideas about aging as a target for, well, designing technologies. Um, and that sort of realm of working, I'm of course also a lot involved in EU level activities um, that specifically design technologies for older people. Um, so maybe just a little bit of a context, um, what you can see at the EU level, but also globally at national levels too. There has been multiple millions, hundreds of millions literally invested in, well, digital technologies and digitization strategies deliberately targeted at 
the alleged challenges of demographic aging. So we can think here of robotics, technologies, monitoring systems, augmented reality, social platforms. So there's a whole range of these technologies. My main question in this regard is, and this is what I, I'll try to elaborate in relation to the questions of inclusivity and accessibility. My main question really here is, why haven't be, these technology projects been successful in the traditional sense? Why do we don't? Why why we do we see sort of a fairly slow uptake of these technologies? Why haven't they led to sort of widespread business models and scaling processes in the field? My conundrum here is, and this is really the question that puzzles me: We are looking at a field that's extraordinarily extraordinarily inclusive. So in all of these technology projects that are often publicly funded, we see stakeholders being involved. We see co-creation being a very significant process. We see almost an obsession with the needs of older people. We need to understand the needs of older people so that we can design for older people better. And my answer, and this is really a tentative answer to this conundrum, is really that while we do involve older people and we do involve stakeholders and we do think about needs of older people a lot, we also have continued to conceive of older people and later life and technology as essentially being two separate, two alien spheres. So older people and aging and technology don't go well together just yet. And I think this is an important element because it is sort of a focal point that may be representative for other areas of digitization as well, because it allows us to talk about digitization in relation to later life as something that's going to happen in the future. What we sometimes forget is that, of course, older people frequently use technologies, um, that digitization is already an ongoing process and is already an ongoing process in the lives of older people. And this separation of aging on the one hand, all the people, and digitization technology on the other hand, I think it has consequences for the way we look at inclusivity and the ways we design processes of including all the people. And this is where, where I can put my first sort of examples on the screen. And this is, again, something that I call interventionism. Uh, uh, sometimes this idea that if we think about digital technologies, older people aging become targets, and we need to think about the added value that these technologies can have in the lives of older people. And these are just a few examples here on the screen. So we talk about cost effectiveness in digital health innovations. We talk about that older people need to remain active and value contributors to society. We talk about all the people as becoming or being valuable resources, an asset in the shrinking labor market. Um, and there's a whole range of these ideas about what kind of value digital technologies can have in relation to aging. Um, and again, these are just examples. I think they're very typical for a whole broad range of policy documents here. I think the, the, the challenge here is really that what we do here is we talk about values for older people, but often these are values that where we say like, if people would use technologies, then this would be the value. It's not per se the values for older people themselves. It's rather a value that sort of older people can have in relation to society. It's something that the tech, digital technology in relation to older people can fulfill in relation to health systems, in relation to rising uh, healthcare costs and so forth. So we define values for them, um, but values only that would become real if we would see an everyday uptake of these technologies. The problem with this is we can already see many technologies in the lives of older people. And this is something we can study. So if we try to understand, and this is my daily research work essentially, is if we try to understand what technology could mean in the lives of older people, we need to look at what it already means in the lives of older people, because this is really the key to understanding what drives an everyday uptake of these devices. So we can study how older people use social media. We can study how they use cell phones to take, uh, to take photos. We can, we can study how they use games already. 
And if we do so, we encounter many of these mundane activities, everyday activities that we all perform with our digital devices. But these devices tell us, or these usages, mundane usages, tell us a lot about the values that drives technology adoptions in everyday life. And these values quite often are not the same. They are quite different to the values that we often assign to, well, digitization, if it would happen at some point in the future. So I think the main challenge here is, or the most significant barrier to inclusive design really here is that we still have this significant and widespread gap between often normative, often medicalized, often even ageist ideas of aging and light, later life in many of the digitization strategies and the real lived experiences, mundane usages of technology that we can find already in the lives of old people. And these things, bringing them closer together is really something that for me is the main challenge of becoming more inclusive in designing for all the people. And this is something we do in the Gatekeeper Project where we are involved as let's say the social science partner. And I'm not gonna go into much detail here. I think we can leave that to the discussion, but I think what we do in Gatekeeper, and I think this is really a way forward to, to, to reach more inclusivity um, beyond what we have now is what we call this idea of empirical ethics. So in Gatekeeper, what we do is we study the lives of older people with technologies. We take key ethical principles like autonomy or beneficent or justice or equality, but we don't, ex we don't explore them as principles, but ra rather we go out in relation to Gatekeeper pilots and study how these ideas and principles play out in the lives of all the people um, when they start using, using particular technologies as those that we are piloting in Gatekeeper. And again, I think that's my key message here is trying to understand everyday use of technologies and trying to understand how these everyday usages contributes to the articulation of values as an empirical object that is something we need to do more, and that will help to understand inclusivity and everyday use of, well, digital technologies by all the people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, for this very interesting provocation. I think that you, you discussed this mainly in connection with other adults, but perhaps uh, there is a, a very broader application of what you mentioned to several areas of society. And indeed, perhaps we, we also need to have a number of things more embedded in our daily lives before we can fully acknowledge how they uh, uh, mess with the tensions <laughs> that, we, that we need to, to address. Uh, here and there. Well, and, and this would leave me. Uh, this would leave me to introduce Claudia. Claudia, I know that um, you have been uh, working in El Shafe, a project that uh, aims to implement a holistic approach for smart, inclusive environments. Perhaps you have something there that also connects and relates to what Alex was telling us about, and of course, other ideas. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Karina. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here. I am delighted. I'm very happy to share the forum with these amazing presentations and very, very interesting projects. So I'm going to share um, my screen and talk about the EU Shafe project and how this fits into this, uh, into this forum. So when we ask, let me see here. Perfect. Um, so yeah, when we ask uh, in this session if we are shaping the digital market to all citizens, well, from our experience, from, uh, from the EU chef perspective, we are finding a way to, to make this happen. So first, what is EU Shafe? Right? EU Shafe is a project that aims to improve policy and policies and practices in six European regions. And we do this by uh, learning, by sharing with a bottom-up approach to influence policy at local, national, or uh, European level. Yeah, this, this project, as, uh, as the name says, it is uh, European focused, but um, let me tell you what the, the, the method on these projects ha have been. So what we do is that we identified good practices. So these are real world projects that our regions have identified that they are working, they're working well, 
uh, with uh, this age-friendly approach. So by now we have, I mean, this one says 35 out of, uh, and out of these 35 book practices, we have 13 focused on health, but now with the evolution of the project, we have identified even more. And this is good news, right? It, it is good that uh, we, we, can, we can talk about projects that are working, that are satisfying the needs uh, of older adults. As, um, as Alex mentioned, there is like this obsession with uh, the needs of, of older adults, but really how, how we identify this, Do, uh, are we able to understand really um, these, these needs and well, these good practices uh, are saying us basically that where there is a will, there is a way. Um, we have, uh, we're talking about infrastructure, about uh, technical devices, about access to internet, but the main thing here that this project has showed us is that the people that are involved in solving these problems are important. So where there's a will, there is a way. To do that, uh, these projects have a user-centered approach and um, it, focus, it focuses on, um, on addressing the needs of these older adults, but with a, with a bottom-up approach. What does this mean? This means that instead of following, um, following the, the public policy structure, which is that the government launches the, their agendas and then these agendas are followed by the local governments and then these local governments implement the solutions on the ground, on the real context, um, we do that differently. We identify these good practices that are solving local level problems, and then we are trying to escalate these solutions to the top so that it can, so, so that these solutions that came from real world context can be pulled down again and rescaled and implemented in other contexts. So the, the bottom, um, the key part here is that uh, we are taking well, with, with, this, with these good practices, we are taking real world problems that, uh, that are being solved and upscaling them into, um, into public policy so that they can fit in different contexts. And here, the key part is different contexts because we are talking about Europe, but in these six regions, what we have learned in, in this, um, throughout this project is that even if it's Europe, we have different infrastructures, different contexts, and it is not easy to implement one solution that is successful, for example, in Ireland, where, I, uh, where I'm based, uh, and apply that to Portugal, because there are, they have different systems. So what could be the, the way to real scale this, um, these projects? And what, what, what are we find, what we are finding is that um, as long as all the stakeholders are involved with this uh, for Elix approach, and as long as there is um, there there is an inclusion of real people of real users in the development of these projects, then we can find um, a way to create more good practices in different contexts. Um, so that is. Um, that is a summary of what Iwishafe is and how can it be, how its perspective can be implemented in, uh, in the inclusiveness of digital market. And in summary, it is that it is listening to the users, but including them in the design process and really understanding their, need, their needs so that they can be applied to different contexts. Thank you so much, Claudia. That was very, very interesting. And I think it also makes a very nice flow uh, from starting from broader initiatives like we discussed in the beginning, EU initiatives, national ones, uh, uh, multi-stakeholder, and now going uh, completely yeah. bottom up <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and uh, bringing uh, uh, maybe a complementary uh, perspective to all of this. So perhaps I could... I'll ask all speakers if you can join us uh, in, in a, a broader discussion now. And perhaps my teasing question, and sorry, because this is, um, well, out of a little bit out of the blue, but I think it would be uh, uh, the question now after this presentation is, 
how do we put all of this together? Because we understood that there are on one side, multiple approaches to, to this different challenges and perhaps not all of them are working. How do we put together this tension be between what comes from governments and at the EU level with what can come from the, the, the practices already implemented? Do any of you have any additions that you'd like to pop in and, and open the mics and just join in the, in the discussion? Yes, sure, sure. Just please open the mics and, and feel free to debate. Thanks, Karina. They're an overwhelming group of presentations, like all of them brilliant. And uh, I took in so much from all of them. In fact, I started taking notes and I was just filling the page and I thought, just listen, because I'll spend all my time writing. <laughs> what, what really um, stood out to me, though, was I think we talked well about um, some of the roles different agencies can take, but really we set out the principles. I think that whole human centeredness came across very clearly. And, and, and really the other thing that resonated to me was there's a huge amount of expertise out there, a, a, a huge amount. So therefore, how do we pick this up? And I think if, if I'm speaking just about health management, the role that health managers can really take is, as I mentioned, they're that middle pillar between policymakers and, and putting things into practice practice. So what health managers can do is as they set the strategic directions of their units, as they develop their leadership pro approaches, they need to be prioritizing and embedding this, all these values that we talked about and all these opportunities. Uh, I talked about, as did Alex, that there's, um, uh, that there's a lot of technology already out there, but it's not being picked up. And so health managers can help direct resources towards that. They can help direct expectations from, from their staff towards that. And they can feed back into decision makers how that's going at a practice level um, into the decision making level. Now, I, I don't want to speak for, um, for now, I actually, I'm not going to name uh, Kiria Kronaki. Is it Katerina or, or Kathy? Kathleen, spoke, Kathleen, yes. Yeah, you spoke really well, in fact, about. Um, um, some of the approaches that are happening at a management level and an organizational level. And I felt like of all the presentations, um, I don't mean to take over facilitation or to point fingers, but I thought that you had some great practice examples there of specific things that can be done. Karina, is that what you're asking about really specific putting things into practice? Well, what we would like to take out of this session, because this was the general idea of having you all together, is also if we can take something home uh, with key uh, action points to be further developed on. And, and of course, that is exactly what you said now. So, yes, I think that's, that's the main aim is to see if we can get some new or old agreements out of this, it doesn't matter, but if we can push them further a little bit and, and uh, commit to, to try to strive for more action in 2022. <laughs> so Catherine, do you want to comment on what George was saying or? Uh, thank you. I, I, I take uh, George's comment as a compliment. This is what we have been striving. I am. I must say that I am a computer um, scientist by training. So all my life, I have been trying to see some of the really inspiring technologies put into practice. And I would like to quote on one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Marcelo Mergala, who said that interoperability is in the minds of the people. For the first uh, 20 years of my career, we were striving to make technology work and speak to each other. But in the end, we understood that unless we make the, uh, the technology understood to people and the problem of interoperability understood by people, this, um, this will never happen. But I must say that we have a unique opportunity today at hand, and that's the opportunity that data bring. Data bring an opportunity, a whole new game, you know, of new services that uh, mean things to people. And trusting the data and trusting the services that are based on data is also based on how much interoperability we have on the ground. Because unless the data are meaningful, you cannot put them in together. So it's, uh, as some people say, garbage in, garbage out. If the data are not good, the, the outcome won't be good and won't be meaningful. And that means that people do not only need to have be digitally literate, they have also to be data literate. 
But Catherine, picking up on something you actually mentioned in the presentation, do you think that we are already at that stage where people understand enough about, well, both digital and data and what it implies, even in terms of services, in order to trust them, which is something that you also mentioned in your presentation and that I think is probably uh, overpassing for uh, all of the presentations today it is that people need to understand and then also it's, it's a very engaged. important question what uh, what you are saying um, and and I think it's the biggest challenge for Europe because we live in a, in a society the, where where people matter we we, we take a lot of um, we pay a lot of attention to what people think and we want the trust of people. We want the trust of people in the services we provide. We want the trust of people in the government services that are out there. So how do we make people trust? That's also linked to the presentation on misinformation. You know, if you, uh, if you try to manipulate people's opinions too much, you lose them. So that takes education. That takes the kind of education that people are challenging what they hear and they are looking for the data behind decisions. They look at the data behind services. And then we have a better society because it's a society of people that participate, of people that are not, uh, are not passive, but they are mm -hmm. active, yeah? Yeah, it's very true. Caris, I was about to ask you, how, how did it work for the, for the Greek government? <laughs> if you feel that there was the, this trust existed, yeah, that is, uh, that's a good question. And I've been hearing um, great opinions uh, on different dimensions uh, during this panel. And um, there are many lessons for me to uh, learn today to, to take away. Um, I think, uh, I mean, taking these points into consideration, I, I think trust is, is built uh, also by engaging the, uh, the people, the citizens, more into the overall process. And, and for that matter, we are trying to, uh, to have uh, here in, uh, in our updated strategy, more civic technologies embedded into the whole process of not just designing, but also implementing and providing the services. So um, we're trying to put the, the, uh, the, the citizens uh, at the center, trying to get more out of the, uh, the input they provide the, on the deliberation process. Uh, so that creates better trust and, and more transparency into the services, I think. And, and this is one of the, of the critical aspects that we've been trying to look in trying to uh, to promote the, um, the the digigov tech laboratory element for different parts of the society and for different parts of the economy testing innovative technologies for different parts of, of uh, society and economy and and embed uh, really actively the civic tech part in it so yeah i think i think we've we heard really interesting points and um uh, it, it's 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 pieces from each one of these presentations that interlink together, you know, could provide a potential, um, uh, you know, a flow behind the, um, a, a possible approach. This is this is my my uh, un understanding at least. Uh, so I, I take some elements from from the different presentations, and I think um, this this would uh, bring up a better um, design uh, strategy. Yeah, it's very true, and I, I see that as soon as we discuss. On, on citizens' views, Alex raised his hand. So I'm also very curious to discuss further with Maria and, and Claudia, but I will pass the floor to you now, Alex, so that you are able to follow up on this. Yeah, indeed, that, that was my sort of, the, the idea of human-centeredness obviously is something that, that stretches across all of the different presentations and indeed is, is at the art of, if we did discuss digitization, um, Probably just also the reminder that human centeredness is, is, it's also a question of how we do that and how we see the human, let's say the human centeredness vis a vis digitization. And um, my take on this sometimes really is, and again, this may be a bit, I'm maybe a bit out of the limp here, is that we often tend to prefigure digitization as, as the objective here, while Sometimes it may be more modestly thinking about this as being a means for something else. And that will offer probably a very different perspective. Um, so I can give you an example from one of the projects where we have been looking into age-friendly housing. Um, and we've looked into a broad range of pilot projects. Some of them were really targeted as 
let's put a lot of technology into homes of people and see how that works out and monitor people very closely. And others were really social innovations, like people trying to find co-housing opportunities, but like-minded people um, being very much embedded in the community, having shopping opportunities nearby. Um, but if you look at those social innovations, you also find technology and digital technologies all around. You find all sorts of different usages of mundane of the shelf technologies, of course, of smartphones, of WhatsApps, and so forth. I think bringing these things together could be a very important way forward, like trying to understand from looking at social innovations, what actual needs in relation to digitizations are and could be, could be a way of sort of breaking out of the rut of thinking of digitization as an end in itself, as something we should be striving for because it will ultimately benefit people. Um, which is still a hypothesis. I mean, digitization will happen, but um, I think that could be a way forward or could mm -hmm. be bringing things together. It's really trying to, to, to think about how we can bring technical innovation and, and social innovation together. Well, if I can add one thing uh, and, and step out of my moderation <laughs> part for one second, just to say that I have a very dear friend who I work with in Guide Aesthetics, also a Dutch one like you, Alex, uh, Daniel Tishink. And he, he says that we have been discussing this wrongly because uh, human and technology are no longer apart and they are no longer in tension. They are built together and we need to consider this from scratch by saying that none is the goal and none is the tool and that uh, uh, both are, are fully interconnected. Perhaps if not already now, but in a, in a very near future, I, I have the feeling <laughs> is very much right. And, and this could perhaps also help to dilute some of the the differences when we discuss, because then we will discuss the person as a whole, which includes already the use of technology in, in the concept of the person. Maybe perhaps for another discussion, <laughs> this is also a nice concept to build on. Before passing to Claudia and Marie, uh, I really want to know how does this resonate outside of the EU, in Africa, in other countries, and of course very much connected to this disinformation issues that you mentioned before. Uh, what can you tell us that adds to the discussion? Thank you, Karina. Um, I mean, I'm really enjoying the discussions and also the presentation of the fellow panelists. It's very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll be very happy to see the notes at the end that you will present to us. Um, yeah, there are, uh, when you look at EU and uh, the rest of the world, there are um, big differences. As I mentioned in my presentation, um, 91% of EU household has access to internet compared to, uh, if you look across the world, it's like 60 to 62%. So there is a there is a big difference to that. And also the quality uh, and the bandwidth of the internet is also very different when you compare these two. Uh, so this is a huge, big difference. Uh, but uh, when you look at the similarities, uh, when, when you come to the topic of marginalized populations, they exist across the world. Uh, even if you look at uh, Europe um, and uh, you look at the immigrant communities, most of the time they are not speaking in the uh, mainstream languages uh, mm -hmm. between them. Uh, so the immigrant communities speak in the native languages. Um, but when it comes to public health and you know vaccination and these kind of access, um, these kind of aspects, uh, all of us are not safe until everyone among us is safe. So it's important to reach to all of this. And um, every uh, we need to think about these individuals as like also when we design uh, public health policies and digital health policies uh, nationwide. Uh, misinformation, if you look at misinformation, it has also affected vaccination drives in um, Eastern and Central Europe. Um, for example, if you look at the percentage of vaccination, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, and even Latvia is uh, heavily lacking. And um, as long as we have a common uh, a free movement in, in the European area, all of us have to be uh, protected to ensure that uh, we all are protected. Um, and we, we are talking also here, we, we also have the discussion about older 
uh, population and media literacy is very, very relevant among this population also. Uh, because many times, like uh, if you look at the fake information or misinformation that you see in the social media, uh, it's probably started by somebody with, uh, let's say, uh, Dr. Paul. And when you say see the name doctor, some people just assume that, okay, this is valid information, mm -hmm. but you need to kind of like develop this media literacy that, you know, it doesn't mean that this is actually a, a medical doctor who has, Im <coughs> who has, um, who is an expert in immunology and uh, epidemiology or vaccinations. Mm -hmm. It might be like, you know, some uh, doctor who has stopped practice 10 years ago. Uh, so, this, these are kind of similarities that you can see like across the world. It's, it happens to all of the uh, people. And when it comes to digitalization efforts, there are also huge differences. Uh, if you look at European Commission, they have la launched a speech recognition project for 24 languages in 2020. There are also initiatives such as European Language Grid uh, available for developing language tools. <clears throat> but when it comes to uh, global initiatives, uh, it's lacking. Google has launched, uh, for example, Global Language Digitalization Initiative. Mozilla has several open source models. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the language models developed for African continent, uh, it's heavily lacking. And also um, vernacular languages in many of the Asian countries, it's heavily lacking. It's a heavily European and um, American focused and also Chinese um, uh, yeah. solutions are also available. Yeah. Sorry. So Mary, yeah. no, no, very, very nice. Yeah. Uh, if uh, I'm going to do a round to ask for some yes. take or messages from anyone and with Claudia with already a question and, and a take home, but perhaps I could already take the chance because you were, you were telling us about all of this very important factors. If you had to choose one thing that you would think would need to be prioritized for 2022, either considering your own context of the project or even broader than this, what would you say is the key aspect to focus on? Um, I think if you're talking about infodemic, it's a huge problem in, uh, in uh, EU. Um, so this is an aspect that needs to be taken into consideration um, in, uh, by uh, public health officials and digital health policies as well. Um, because it's it's not only it's not going to end with COVID nineteen. Uh, this kind of misinformation is going to spread on many many other aspects. So this is an aspect that needs to be taken consideration and strategies to deal with uh, misinformation spreading through social media should be an element. Um, and also increasing media literacy to help mm -hmm. individuals to identify misinformation. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Very nice. And, and Claudia, going, going to you because you were missing one, one contribution before. I don't know if you want to add something to the discussion as we were uh, going through and, and ended before in Alex and then with Marie, or if I can ask you something specific. <laughs> with... you, you can ask me something specific, but I also have a, a, a question for Alex. Um, so, um, well, in, in my project, in this case, the um, well, Alex mentioned no, to, to to take a different look, not just to see technology for the sake of technology. No, so in 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 our project, uh, uh, the end is well-being. No, so how technology can be the mean to an end, and this and in this in this case, it is uh, the well-being. But um, when we are including. Um, this for Alex approach, so different sectors to create this um, this influence in policy or to create different projects. When we're talking in a real context, do you have like a, a recommendation for um, for methods that could be implemented in the design phase so that everyone involved in the creation of these projects or in the creation of these policies or in the creation of whatever can really yeah, can really understand the the user because i mean i i am a i am a designer but i also have uh, this experience with research 
And if you tell me, oh, well, we, uh, we have a phenomenology approach. Okay, that's grand. But if I talk with a, with a designer that doesn't have a background in research, how can I, how can I communicate that and give them the tools so that this happens in the real context? Thanks, Claudia. I think that's that's a good question. And my experience, first of all, I think my experience with designers is that quite often designers already are very, very good at applying qualitative social science methods, so to speak. Uh, so, in, in in my my, I think the best projects often are those that involve designers and social scientists alongside with each other. Um, and I, that that would probably the most tangible idea here would be to involve these two disciplines to understand use from a more qualitative perspective. So doing in-depth inquiries rather than trying to sort of have some randomized control or some some measurable stuff, but go for go for the the everyday life stuff, qualitative inspiration. Um, I think many designers already do that. Uh, I'm, I'm not, that's, that's, that's also my experience and where designers in particular is strong. On a more principal level, probably the idea of well-being, and that's a conceptual point, not a methodological one, not to see it as something that exists independent of technology, but try to understand how well-being already now is something that depends on the technology devices that surround us. And it's already a, a material idea. Well, what that means in methodological terms, I think there's still a lot of room to be explored here, but, but trying to look at the use of devices already now and try to understand how that feeds into well-being and is entangled with the idea of well-being. That's, that's I think, the, the minor tweak that can make a big difference. Thank you, Alex. Thank that's you. very Thank interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I like this idea of a constant dialogue, uh, which I'm sure would be helpful for a lot of things like we are doing here today <laughs> between other, between experts. And, and perhaps we can do it also on the societal level easily uh, with, with different stakeholders. So, Claudia, to pass on to the rest, do you have any take home message very quickly that you would like to highlight before we go? Yes, just to contribute a bit more to what Alex said, uh, I think my um, my takeaway would be focus on people, but also care about people, and uh, don't um, uh, when when you're designing projects recognize the value of qualitative of qualitative research, because what I've seen that happens in the real world is that quantitative uh, quantitative research, it is often overpowering qualitative research because mm -hmm. of the time optimization. So um, that will be another key takeaway, maybe a little bit of topic, but um, qualitative research is really, uh, has really a contribution for designing projects. That's very interesting, Claudia, and I think very well taken. Alex, do you want to do your takeaway based on this? And then I will pass to George, who has already clapped more than once, so we will be happy to have you back. I, I, I could probably just second Claudia, because that was my main takeaway as well, is if what, what's the action for next year, thinking about different collaborations and involving qualitative researchers and designers, probably, alongside with more technical-oriented researchers and moving towards more in-depth studies rather than striving for evidence in the traditional sense. That's that's a way to go, in my view. Yes. Thanks, Alex. George, do you want to comment and follow up? Yeah, on that? thanks, Karina. I really applaud that request for more qualitative information. We definitely need that. I'm going to seem to betray it now and go the other way and say <laughs> also <laughs> what we Fair need enough. is given that we have um, such a, an amount of data, some people like to call it big data. I don't know the difference between big data and not big data. So with all this data, we need we need patient confidence. We need patient engagement, and um, so we need we need an ongoing 
commitment to improving the governance of patient data. And, and I'm thinking of qualitative, quantitative, quantitative data just now. And I, and I say that in betrayal of, I'm just so excited to hear about this generation of more qualitative research. So I want to pick both, but if I had to pick just the one, I'd say I want better governance of, of big data. <laughs> Thanks, George. Catherine, you were also smiling. Tell us your takeaway. <laughs> I, I really think that this is an exciting uh, panel. That's how, why I was smiling. And I would like to congratulate you, LDCH Alliance, for putting uh, these different elements together. It's, it's re refreshing. And I am I'm so pleased. Now, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, fam famous last words, I think everything that mattered was said. Maybe I can. I can just uh, uh, reinforce the message of the previous uh, speakers by saying that uh, it's, it's all about co-creation. It's all about co-creation and governance and alignment. And one particular issue that we need to understand a little bit more is how do we can make and launch meaningful services, putting the person in the center. So, do not launch any other technical projects without having a skills component, without having an economic feasibility component. Because right now we are, uh, we are forgetting everything about how to make sustainable product, uh, projects. And, and essentially the people are at the center. Otherwise the projects will die. And, and that and the One Digital Health Initiative are, are probably my biggest aspiration uh, for the future. So thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Caris, I take it now to you. Please tell so us not your last words, <laughs> but your final words for today. Yeah, I, I hope I don't have the last <laughs> insightful words. <laughs> but uh, indeed, I, I echo what Catherine has said. Really, really important topic. I mean, really, really important uh, key tip to take away. But I just like sort of try to summarize what I've what I've heard in the in the in the key elements at the end and that I think that you know uh, as a very good friend has said I agree that digitization should not be an objective in itself and and great technological minds should should basically fight against digital elitism and alienation so I think this this covered more or less the, the aspects of of the needs for digital skills for, for promoting that uh, and 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 uh, that would I think be the way to to solve many of these issues. Well, I am very confident after hearing to all of you after hearing uh, this panel and the discussions that we are in a good way because <laughs> uh, I, um, it gives me some hope that we are in a good way because a lot of you have important roles and I, I do think that we are very much in tune, even if going for complementary perspectives. So this, this gives me much hope on the future. And uh, I really hope also that this was interesting for you and for all the participants, because some of you also get to know each other and each other's initiatives. And this is also important for us to strive for, for uh, um, common challenges and common messages. So I do hope we can take some advantage of this. I would ask also Carolina if she can come in for a second in the camera and perhaps take a, a full picture of the team and the speakers so that we can also use it further. And I am I really hope that we can meet each other soon again and perhaps continue this discussion next year. Thank you so much to all and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> Thank you all. It was great to, to be part of this session. Great to listen to you. Thank you very much to all of you.